Greetings. This is Interim Prime Minister Vogel Denise Newsom with the Utica International Embassy. We have created this video using excerpts from the June 2008 hearings before the United States House Committee on the Judiciary, Subcommittee on the Constitution and Civil Justice. We look forward to using this video in support of the communication and or criminal complaints being drafted for the International Criminal Court, Department of Justice and or International Tribunals. We also look forward to using this video in support of investigations and prosecution of individuals who may be found engaging in war crimes at the Guantanamo Bay prison, crimes of murder, torture, etc. This hearing of the Subcommittee on the Constitution, Civil Rights, and Civil Liberties will come to order. Today's hearing will be the third in our series of hearings on the role of administration lawyers in the formulations of interrogation policies. I want to say at the outset that the subject matter we're considering today is of utmost importance to the integrity and honor of this nation. This hearing is very important, and it will not be permitted to be disrupted by anyone in the audience for any purpose. Anyone who is disruptive in any way will be expelled immediately and without further proceedings. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess of the hearing, which I hopefully will not have to do, um, except if there are votes on the floor. We will now proceed to members' opening statements. As has been the practice in this subcommittee, I will recognize the chair and ranking members of the subcommittee and of the full committee to make opening statements. In the interest of proceeding to our witnesses and mindful of our busy schedules, I would ask that other members of the, of the subcommittee submit their statements for the record. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days to submit opening statements for inclusion in the record. The chair now recognizes himself for five minutes for an opening statement. Today we commence the third in our series of hearings on the role of administration lawyers in the development and implementation of interrogation rules which have drawn criticism here in the United States and around the world. I think it does not go too far to say that the reputation of this nation and our standing as the leading exponent of human rights and human dignity have been besmirched by the policies of this administration. Legal memos have been written defining torture out of existence and what almost everyone except this administration regards torture has been inflicted on prisoners. Today we will look at how these policies came into being and how they were applied. I think I speak for many of my colleagues when I say that the more we find out about what was done and how it was concerned and how it was justified, the more appalled we become. These policies have been kept from the Congress and the American people by assertions of secrecy, assorted privileges, and flat refusals to disclose what has been done and why, even in classified settings. As a result, the information that we do know has come out in drips and drabs often through the press. That is unacceptable. We live in a democracy composed of three equal branches of government. No one has the right to arrogate to themselves the complete and unchecked power of the state. That simply defeats the design of our system of checks and balances, which the founders of, the, of this nation crafted to ensure our freedom and protect us from the unaccountable monarchy against which we rebelled and to which we do not want to return. Today we are joined by two of the architects of those policies, one testifying voluntarily and one testifying under subpoena. And I hope we will be able to have a free and open discussion of these very important questions. Clearly, we do not want to reveal classified information in this open setting, but neither will we be deterred by expansive and unjustified claims of assorted privileges. I would ask that if the witnesses feel the need to invoke a privilege, they do so judiciously and that they provide the specific basis for that claim of privilege. I look forward to the testimony of our witnesses, and I hope we can finally begin getting to the bottom of these important questions. I yield back the balance of my time. I now want to welcome our distinguished panel of witnesses today and introduce them. David Addington is the Chief of Staff and former counsel to Vice President uh, Dick Cheney. Uh, Mr. Addington was Assistant General Counsel for the Central Intelligence Agency from 1981 to 1984. From 1984 to 1987, he was counsel for the House Committee's Committees on Intelligence and International Relations. He served as a staff attorney on the joint U.S. House Senate Committee investigation of the Iran-Contra scandal as an assistant to Congressman and now Vice President Dick Cheney. 
and was one of the principal authors of a controversial minority report issued at the conclusion of the Joint Committee's investigation. Mr. Addington was also a special assistant to President Ronald Reagan for one year in 1987 before becoming President Reagan's deputy assistant. From 1989 to 1992, Mr. Addington served as special assistant uh, to Mr. Cheney, who was then the Secretary of Defense, before being confirmed as the Department of Defense's General Counsel in 1992. From 1993 to 2001, he worked in private practice. Mr. Addington is a graduate of the Edmund A. Walsh School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University and holds a JD from Duke University School of Law. John Yu is a professor of law at the University of California Berkeley School of Law, where he has taught since 1993. From 2001 to 2003, he served as a Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the Office of Legal Counsel of the U.S. Department of Justice. He served as General Counsel of the U.S. Senate Judiciary Committee from 1995 to 1996. Professor Yu received his B.A. summa cum laude in American History from Harvard and his J.D. from Yale Law School in 1992. In law school, he was an articles editor of the Yale Law Journal. He clerked for Judge Lawrence H. Silverman of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit. He joined the Boalt faculty in 1993 and then clerked for Justice Clarence Thomas of the U.S. Supreme Court. Chris Schroeder, or Schrader, which is it? Schrader. Schrader. Chris Schrader is the Charles S. Murphy Professor of Law and Public Policy Studies at Duke University. He served in the Office of Legal Counsel for three and a half years, including six months as Acting Assistant Attorney General in charge of the office. He has also served as Chief Counsel to the Senate Judiciary Committee. He is of counsel to the firm of Old Mulvaney and Myers, where he works primarily on appellate matters. He received his BA degree from Princeton University in 1968, an M a Master of Divinity from Yale University in 1971, and his JD degree from University of California, Berkeley, Bowell Hall in 1974, where he was Editor-in-Chief of the California Law Review. Before we begin, it's customary for the committee to swear in its witnesses. If the witnesses would please stand and raise your right hands to take the oath. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give is true and correct to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? Thank you. Let the record reflect that the witness is answered in the affirmative, and you may be seated. Committee. Uh, this Judiciary Committee I'm so proud of, the Constitution Committee in particular, and uh, the way we go about uh, making history around these questions. Now, uh, we, we have uh, uh, several points here that will be examined. We have reports stating that our witnesses today played a central role in drafting Justice Department legal opinions on interrogations. Uh, some of those opinions have been withdrawn. But uh, let's listen to Senator Lindsey Graham of the Armed Forces Committee, uh, what he said last week about these memos. said uh, that while he thought that administration lawyers uh, may have had good intentions, but he said they used, and I quote here, they used bizarre legal theories to justify harsh interrogation techniques, end quote. Now, uh, Mr. Adding, Professor, Mr. Addington, Professor Yu, uh, I come here to give you the benefit of the doubt. Uh, and we want to hear your side of it. Uh, I'd, li I'd like to understand how these memos came to be written and why. 
I'd like to learn more about your view of the uni unitary executive theory of government in which the president is supposed to be superior to some or all of the laws or, or, or wherever that leads. Uh, I'm, I'm interested in Professor Yu's uh, description of, uh, of uh, this public debate that he entered into uh, of if the president could order that a suspect's child be tortured in gruesome fashion and that his response was, I think it depends on why the president thinks he needs to do that. Uh, uh, or is there anything that the president could not order to be done to a suspect if he believed it necessary for the national defense? Uh, and, and that line of questions uh, are all very important to me. We want to, we want to understand this and we want to have a, a fair discussion about it. So thank you, uh, Chairman Nadler, for permitting me uh, these opening comments. Uh, the gentleman from Iowa is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, perhaps I'd quote the chairman of the full committee and we could take the temperature down in here just a little bit. And I've always found the chairman to be a gentleman, and I point that out to the witnesses today. I do too, sir. Uh, Mr. Chairman Conyers has a long and distinguished history. And that is something, that's a unanimous uh, opinion on this Judiciary Committee, I believe. And uh, I wanted to take you back, uh, Mr. Addington, uh, and just simply um, give you a little latitude to express yourself here. Um, the book Torture Team by Felipe Sanz, which has been quoted here a number of times and seems to be the source of the criticism, uh, refuted uh, by uh, at least two of the witnesses here at the panel today. And uh, I'd ask, uh, what, what do you have to say about the credibility of the the information that's in that book and and without necessarily impugning the author, if that could be done? Yes, I've read the book. Um, I can't, of course, as a witness who's under oath, address every word on every page in the book. Uh, there are things in there, as I recall from reading it, that were accurate, and there were things in there that weren't. Uh, and and uh, Professor Yu, the same question? Um, so I haven't uh, read the book. I, I did read Mr. Sands' testimony before this committee, and I noticed in the testimony he said that he had interviewed me for the book. And I can say that he did not interview for me for the book. He asked me for an interview and I declined, so I, I didn't quite understand why he would tell the committee that he had actually interviewed me. And, and, and with that answer, Professor Yu, then uh, I'm going to interpret that to mean that at least with regard to that statement that he had interviewed you, you find that to be a false statement. And, and that would perhaps reflect on the veracity of the balance of the book. I, I can't tell what else is in the book, but I, I don't understand why he would say that he interviewed me for the book. I can tell the committee that he contacted me once. He wanted to interview me for the book, and I said, I, I don't want to talk to you. I, I wrote my own book. You can look at my own book. Everything I have to say is in uh, my book. And then he told the committee that he'd interviewed me. Uh, thank you, Professor. Let me just take this a little bit uh, a different way. and. And, you know, we're here, uh, Constitution Subcommittee of the House Judiciary Committee, uh, reviewing, uh, apparently, the process by which the administration reached a conclusion, which seems to be a little bit amorphous at this point. And, uh, and it's still in the middle of the war, trying to put it within the context of 2008 rather than the context of 2001, uh, with the smoking hole at Ground Zero, uh, still a smoking hole, with the reconstruction of the Pentagon uh, not perhaps yet begun, and uh, in an entirely different environment. And I, and I would make this point that um, without regard to constitutionality or statute with regard to torture, there was a different environment and a different context with which the president had to make decisions. And I am, I believe, uh, reliably informed that the president has taken the position consistently that prisoners will be treated humanely. Now, that definition of humane may be up uh, for question, but within this context, it's a similar context with which we went in to liberate Iraq. And I will make this point that had the president not taken action, 
if the president had said, uh, we're going to make sure that we treat every prisoner with the idea, the advice that the ranking member of the committee put up on the screen at the beginning of and during his opening statement, that we're going to make friends with them and um, and uh, cuddle up to them and gain their trust and then we'll find out everything we need to know and we can surely rely on somebody we're nice to to tell us the truth. If the president had taken that approach, and if the president had also taken the approach that in spite of the global evidence, the global intelligence evidence of the weapons of mass destruction that, uh, that Iraq had, if he had either said, I don't believe that that exists, and if we do send troops, they're going to go in without, let's just say, weapons against chemical weapons, or without defense against chemical weapons of mass destruction. If the president had misstepped anywhere along the way and misinterpreted that very cautionary evidence that was out there, and we had been attacked again by the terrorists, which we have not effectively been so on this soil since September 11th of 2001, any little trip along the way would have been turned back on him as having either not taking action against weapons of mass destruction in Iraq or not extracting the intelligence that was necessary to protect the American people from a terrorist attack. If he had been soft on this, the president might well be uh, brought before this committee or at least as the, the subject of the committee. We might have seen another series of hearings like we saw in this same room in 1998 if the president hadn't taken action. And, and I would ask uh, Mr. Addington if you'd care to characterize this within the context of the, of the circumstances during the time that uh, this uh, question here today. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I'm careful in doing so um, because of the point I made at the outset, that everyone here I recognize wants to defend the United States of America and their constituents from attack. The chairman, for example, lost several thousand in his district. Um, he has the Twin Towers in his district, so I don't want to appear to be lecturing on I care more about protecting Americans than you do, and I don't, I know you don't either, Mr. Franks, uh, want to be seen that way. Um, the, it's okay. I'm sorry, Mr. King. Thank you. The, um, we looked, I looked, I should say, through basically three filters as we considered these kinds of issues back, as you say, when they were still smoking, the Twin Towers and the Pentagon. Uh, the first filter in deciding what we have to do is support and defend the Constitution of the United States. Uh, we all have to start there. Every one of us, members of Congress, me, everybody in the executive branch, takes the same oath. That's where we all start. We have to take the oath to support and defend. The President has a different oath, but the rest of us all took the, the oath to support and defend the Constitution. The second filter you look through in deciding how we can approach these issues, at least I did, was how, within the law, and I emphasize that, within the law, I help maximize the president's options in dealing with it. Third filter is when you go to war, you ask a lot of people to do very tough things. Uh, on this committee, I know there are some veterans, chairman and uh, Congress, I know served in, in the Korean War era, and, and there are others who serve. You ask people to do young men to do tough things, young women to do tough things in wartime. Same with our intelligence agents. You want to make sure that whatever orders they're given, they're legally protected. You don't want to find out later somebody thinks, oh, let's investigate that. Maybe they're wrong. You want to be careful about it. So everything we did in that era, at least that's what I carried in my head to measure recommendations or legal advice as they were going through. Now, the one thing I would add to what you said, Mr. King, is things were different back then. You know, the smoke's still rising. It was fresh in our memories that 3,000 Americans were just killed by al-Qaeda terrorists. And that's true. Things are not as different today as people seem to think. We're dealing with intelligence on threats every day. We have to consider these things. Now, there can be legitimate judgments and disputes, and, and this committee has had them go on throughout the government about what combination of, of activities should, should deal with these sorts of things. Uh, but no American should think, we're free, the war is over, Al Qaeda is not coming, and they're not interested in getting us, because that's wrong. I thank you, Mr. Addington, and all the witnesses. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I thank you, gentlemen. I now recognize for five minutes the uh, gentleman from Alabama. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, thank you for coming today. Mr. Yu, I have not read your book, but I did you the courtesy of reading your opening statement, and I want to have some conversation with you about it. In your opening statement, your written statement, you make the observation that it was your analysis, 2001-2002 rather, that the anti-torture statute passed by Congress in the 1990s, the interpretation of that statute would depend, as you put it, 
quote, not just on the particular interrogation method, but on the subject's mental and physical condition. Uh, I interpret your observations as meaning that the test of torture is in part a subjective standard, that one has to do an inquiry into what you describe as the subject's physical and mental condition. Now, in response to Chairman Conyers' question, she said, that that interpretation did not come from the legislative history because there was very little. You said it did not come from reviewing judicial opinions because there were none. And your phrase today was that there was very little, there was no congressional guidance, no congressional guidance. One good source of congressional guidance is members of Congress. So I would ask you if you or in your knowledge anyone else in the administration consulted, for example, the chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, <clears throat> Mr. Sensenbrenner at that time, a Republican, about the meaning of the anti-torture statute. Uh, Mr. Davis, uh, thanks for the... That's the simple question. Was Mr. Sensenbrenner consulted? Yeah. Um, First, I just want to correct one thing I said that you quoted, just to be clear. There, there are uh, judicial opinions on a related statute called the Torture right. Victim Protection I understand that. Was Mr. Sensenbrenner consulted? Um, I would not know one way or the Mr. other. Mr. Addington, do you know if Mr. Sensenbrenner was consulted? That's a simple was or wasn't he? Yeah, I did not consult him, and I do not know whether anyone else did or did not. The chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, I believe, was Mr. Spector, a Republican. Do either of you know if Mr. Spector was consulted? regarding the meaning of the anti-torture statute. I did not consult him. I don't know whether he was or wasn't. Mr. Yu, do you happen to know? It's irrelevant to the legal interpretation. Mr. Yu, do you happen to know if Chairman Spector was consulted? Uh, I don't know one way or the other. And there is a process that's been alluded to today of consulting with members of the House and Senate Intelligence Committees regarding certain matters that, frankly, we wouldn't want to disclose in open forum. Mr. Yu, did you or anyone else in the administration consult members of the House or Senate Intelligence Committees regarding Congress's intent regarding the anti-torture statute? Um, all I know is what I've read in the newspaper. That is a simple, were they or were they not consulted? Do you know if they were? Again, all I know is what I've read in the papers about it. To your knowledge, were they or were they not consulted, Mr. Yu? You mean, to my knowledge, um, back yes. Um, I, uh, to your knowledge, they were not, I, were they? I don't know. Mr. Addington, to your knowledge, were the members of the House or Senate Intelligence Committee consulted regarding the question of Congress's intent regarding the anti-torture statute? There is no reason their opinion on that would be relevant. Is that enough? I, I did not consult them, and I do not know whether... Now, let me make... Thank you all for answering those questions without too much struggle. One of the interesting things here today, Mr. Yu and Mr. Addington, is that, frankly, we've heard this word context over and over again. And I've heard both of you say, I've heard my colleagues and my friends on the side of the aisle say, you got to remember the context. We had been threatened, we'd been attacked, there was a possibility of follow-up attacks. All of that's accurate. But let me tell you the rest of the context. You had a Congress that was a rubber stamp for the administration's entire security agenda. You had chairman of the House and Senate Judiciary Committees who were strongly supportive of your agenda. You came to Congress and asked for the Patriot Act, and you got it, easily. You came to Congress and asked for an authorization of force resolution, and you got it, easily. You got bipartisan support for both of them. The 107th, 108th, 109th Congresses, there was not a single time the Bush administration was rebuffed on any issue related to national security. You got an expansion of FISA that met your interests. You got a Military Tribunal Commissions Act that met your interests. We wouldn't be here today, gentlemen, if you had come to this Congress and you had said one of two things. Either give us a stronger, clearer definition of what torture means, or if you'd even gone to congressional leadership and said, you're a source of guidance on what Congress meant. Tell us, Chairman Sensenbrenner, you were there. Tell us, Chairman Specter, you were there. 
the problem, Mr. Addington, I direct my last observation to you because you still serve with this administration. When you've got a Congress that's a rubber stamp for what you want, you ought not be disrespectful of the legislative branch of government. If you had come to this Congress, everyone in this room knows to an absolute certainty they would have given you anything you asked for in October 2001. If you had said, give me a definition that fits, if Mr. Yu had written the statute, if he had said, give us a torture statute that makes torture a subjective condition depending on the person's mental or physical state, you could have gotten that. You didn't even trust people who were rubber stamps for you. And I'll give back the balance of my time. I thank the gentleman. I now recognize for five minutes the gentleman from Minnesota. Mr. Yu, you wrote the um, Biden memo of August 2002. Is that right? Um, Mr. Uh, Ellison, as I described in the opening... I need a yes or no, sir. I did not write it by myself. Did you write it at any part? I contributed to the drafting of it. Okay, so you, you, you contributed to a drafting of it. What percentage of the drafting did you write? Um, it's, it's difficult for me to... And you, do you, to check, you checked in with Addington about uh, what you were going to cover? He said you did. Can I uh, were you, were you, August you, 1, 2002 memo? Of course. Was, did you and check so in with Addington as he just said you did? I um, unfortunately do not have the same so you can't, guidance as Mr. Addington does because the Justice Department has told me I'm not allowed to talk about any individuals. I'm only allowed to talk about... Was Mr. Addington telling the truth when he said you checked in with him what? over what you are going to cover? Let me describe it. I, I know. I want you to say yes or no. I gave the draft of the opinion to the White House Counsel's Office, which would be... So when he just um, said he ca you came in to tell us what he's going to cover, you cannot confirm that. Is that right? No, I'm not saying that at all, Mr. Well, say, well, answer I, my question. Say yes or no. And so it's up to the White House Counsel to decide who within the White Stop, House... Stop, sir. I'm asking you to tell me to confirm whether what Mr. Addington reported to this committee was right or not right. That's simple. I hope this isn't coming out of my time, Mr. Chairman. We're, we're a little flexible. Yeah, so Who else? Mr. Ellison, I'm, I'm afraid I have to follow the guidance provided by the Justice Department on on this question. So confirm what Addington said, deny what Addington said, or say I cannot answer the question, and what privilege are you asserting? Uh, I can't answer the question because of the instruction by the Justice Department Thank that you. I'm not allowed to Thank you. Who else was present when Addington, uh, when you checked in with Addington? Uh, sir, you're assuming I answered your last Is that a repeat of the last answer? Do you repeat, is that, is, do you stick with the last the answer? Question was, who else was in the room when I checked in with Addington? Right. And you can assert your privilege again if you choose, do you? It's not my choice. The Justice Department has told me I can only talk about the office. So, so, so at some point, this 2002 memo was implemented. Is that right? Uh, what do you mean by implemented, sir? Well, do you know what the word implemented uh, is? The gentleman will suspend for a moment uh, and stop the clock, please. Uh, Professor, are you, are you asserting a privilege? I, on the last question of the previous two, I don't know them. Um, the first two he asked me, I have to, because of instructions by the Justice Department, that I can't uh, discuss internal deliberations. I can and exactly what privilege are you asserting? Um, I assume the Justice Department, I, I, I can't say what the Justice Department's belief for the, no, 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 no. they ordered me not to discuss. Well, hold on. Um, you're, you're testifying for a congressional committee. Okay. The Justice Department cannot order you um, with regard to your testimony, it can instruct you to take a privilege if you are entitled to a privilege. You can take the privilege without the instructions if you're entitled to the privilege. Um, if you are asserting a privilege, you're entitled to do so, but we're entitled to ask you what privilege it is you're asserting. Yes, so, uh, and whether they're ordering you to assert a privilege or not, if the privilege is there, you can assert it. If it isn't there, you can't assert it, whatever they say. Uh, I believe it's the attorney-client privilege, sir. <laughs> So you're asserting the attorney-client privilege and, and, and not answering the question you were asked. And we will, we will take that. Uh, since you, you are um, um, not here under subpoena, we will take that under advisement and, uh, 
and consider that at the end of the hearing. Uh, we'll resume the, uh, the questioning and the clock will resume. Mr. Yu, are you denying knowledge of what the word implement means? No, I want, I want to know. What does implement mean, sir? You're asking me to define what you mean by the word? No, I'm asking you to define what you mean by implement. What do you understand the term to mean? I mean, it can mean a wide number of things. Okay, look, you, wrote a, you contributed to the writing of the 2002 memo, is that right? Yes, I do. The name I, on the memo was Bobby, but you contributed to the memo, right? Yes, sir. The memo was implemented at some point, is that right? What do you mean by implemented, sir? What I mean by implemented is the guidance that was set forth in that legal memorandum was followed and put into action. Do you understand what I mean by implemented now, sir? So you're asking me, was I the memo just told followed? You. Was the memo followed? By I'm not going to get into semantical games with you in this five minutes. I need you to answer the question or refuse to. Was I the memo implemented. The memo was signed. And provide I know what sign means, and so do you. Stop wasting my time, Mr. Yu. I'm not trying to, sir. Was the memo followed? Will you accept followed? I, I, I don't have personal knowledge about how it was followed, but I expect... I didn't ask you about how. I asked you whether it was followed, sir. Sir, you're asking me about things that other people would have done, not me. So the fact is, so the memo was never put into effect. Is that, are you making that claim? No, 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 sir. Let me, let me go back and refer to my opening statement. Get it. Mr. Schroeder, do you understand what implement means? Uh, I think I do. Yes, sir. Was this memo, this 2002 memo, which Mr. Yu refuses to answer questions about, ever put into effect? Because I have no personal knowledge. I wasn't even I'm not asking about personal knowledge. I'm based on your study. My understanding is that the, the memo was uh, prompted, at least in part, by a specific request of the CIA with respect to what kinds of procedures their operatives would be able to use in interrogating some high-level al-Qaeda detainees. And was that once the advice was forthcoming, my understanding is all from published investigative reporting. I have no first-hand knowledge myself, is that some of the techniques that uh, fell on the legal side of the line, according to the memorandum, were employed. So is that right, Mr. Yu, were the legal techniques to you outlined in this memo employed? Were the techniques that were legal? Let me say this. We did not make decisions about policy. I didn't ask you about that. I did not ask you about that, sir. I want to know if the legal advice that you gave in that memo was followed, or if you expected it was followed. You know, again, Mr. Ellison, I don't did anyone did anyone ever come to you and ask you for an interpretation of your memo? Uh, interpretation of my memo? Did the interrogators ever come back and say we got the memo? Without objection, the gentleman will have one additional minute to finish right. this line of questioning. Did the interrogators ever return to you and say, you know, you've given us this memo, and but we want to implement a certain technique? Does do, are we, do we fall within the memo? Was that scenario ever played out? Again, sir, because of the instructions of the Justice Department, I can't tell you. That's not my clock, I assume. Mr. Schroeder, I was, was Mr. Schroeder, was the memo in effect during Abu Ghraib? Uh, the, the gentleman will suspend again. Professor Yu, are you asserting a privilege? What was the question? What was the question? Okay. I heard. I... Um, sir, I, I'm afraid uh, Mr. Ellison's questions we involve a discussion of classified information, which, because of congressional statute, I'm not at liberty to discuss in a public setting. So you are asserting the privilege against the revelation of classified information in answering your question? Uh, I don't know if that's a privilege. I just can't do that, sir. <laughs> I don't know saying it's a privilege. I just can't. That's a violation of the law. Well, so you're asserting that the, that the uh, well, in order to answer Ms. Ellison's question, you would have to reveal classified information? I might have to, sir. Might have to or do have to? Can you, let me, let me rephrase the question. As I understand, let me, let me, let me rephrase the question. Is there any way you can answer Mr. Ellison's question without revealing classified information? 
Yeah, as I understand the question, I would have to discuss classified information to provide him a complete answer. I don't okay. think I can do that, sir. Well, again, we'll take that under advisement. Uh, Mr. Chairman, let me make a parliamentary inquiry. i make a parliamentary inquiry, yes. Chair. The General of the State is parliamentary inquiry. I would inquire of the Chair after we come back from our break from voting on the floor, if the Chair would consider directing particularly the two government witnesses, Mr. Yu and Mr. Addington. I have noticed, Mr. Chairman, I've been on the committee for a year and a half. I've never seen two witnesses, frankly, struggle as much to appreciate ordinary use of terms and questions. Would you consider instructing the two witnesses to answer the questions that they're asked, and if they wish to elaborate or clarify them, they can ask to do so. But given that we have time constraints, I would ask that the Chair admonish the witnesses to err on the side of being responsive as opposed to constantly quick over word choice because I've never seen it to the degree I've seen it today. I will certainly consider that as we uh, break, uh, uh, which we will recess in a few minutes for the votes on the floor. The gentleman uh, can, can uh, finish his questioning. My question is, were the, was, were, were the interrogators, were the, the ones who were addressing the witnesses who were being interrogated, were those individuals, did they have a lawyer that they could they could go to to ask about guidance as to what they could do or could not do under the guidance of the memo that you contributed to writing. Uh, Mr. Ellison, as I understand the structure of our government, the CIA has its own general counsel's office, and I believe it's over about a hundred lawyers. So, um, if you, I assume you believe that the CIA conducted interrogations, and if you did, they have a general counsel's office to ask legal questions. Were well, you ever asked questions about whether certain techniques or others were permissible under the guidance you gave in that memo? Um, as, I, as I said to uh, the chairman just a second ago, I'm afraid I think your question asked Were you, were you, uh, you were asserting the point? <coughs> were, were, were you ever asked whether waterboarding was permissible under the uh, advice you gave? Sir, if you'll let me finish, I can't answer your question because okay. I believe it. The gentleman, the gentleman will suspend again. Okay, you're asserting that you cannot answer the question as to whether the CIA asked you uh, questions regarding the uh, legality of waterboarding without uh, revealing classified information. Is that your assertion? Yes, sir. Okay. Did, did you we'll, hold, we'll hold that. We'll hold that under advisement. And the gentleman's time has expired. One last question. I, I, well, without objection, the gentleman has 30 seconds additional. Did your memo allow for the use of sicking dogs on inter interrogated individuals? I'm afraid I have to uh, give the same answer, but I will point uh, to excuse the... Excuse me a second. Excuse me a second. The question was, did your memo allow for that? That's not confidential. Mr. Your memo revealed to public. Mr. Chairman, parliamentary inquiry. Wait, one second. Let him answer the question. The August, you're referring again to the August 1st, 2002 memo. The memo speaks for itself. It does not discuss uh, what you just mentioned. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. I just simply want to make the parliamentary inquiry the procedure here, uh, whether who's actually asking the questions and if the privilege of the chair is uh, reflective of the executive privilege that has been denied the President of the United States. I just can't keep with the flow when the chair uh, is asking questions on behalf of the member who's been recognized. Excuse me, the, the, the chair was not asking questions but trying to ascertain what privilege is being asserted, asserted and at one point trying to clarify so that we don't go back and forth with misunderstanding. I think I saved a little time. The gentlelady from Florida is recognized for five minutes, after which we will recess. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Addington, uh, there are press reports that state that in September of 2002, you and other administration lawyers visited Guantanamo, Guantanamo Bay. A JAG attorney in Guantanamo, Diane Beaver, was quoted in a Vanity Fair article as saying that the message from you and the other visitors was, do whatever needed to be done. And just weeks after that visit, interrogators at Guantanamo Bay began developing a far harsher interrogation program than they had ever used before. Did you visit Guantanamo Bay in September of 2002, as has been reported? I don't remember the exact date, but I went there a number of times. Well, do you recall going to Guantanamo Bay around that time? I really don't remember the dates, ma'am, but uh, I remember going in the... the How many times have you been, did you go to the Guantanamo, no, Guantanamo Bay during that period? During that, well, I'm not sure what period you're describing. I'd say I've probably been to Guantanamo, I guess, maybe five times. 
first time would have been years ago, which isn't relevant to this, when I worked at the Department of Defense. And then I've probably been, I would guess, three or four. On one of those trips, did you meet with JAG attorneys? I didn't recall it. I remember when um, um, Ms. Bieber, uh, Colonel Bieber, who, who uh, uh, was referenced, I think, in Mr. Sands' Vanity Fair article. Uh, I did not remember meeting her there. The only time I remember meeting her is uh, over at the Office of General Counsel of the Department of Defense many years later. What generally prompted your trips to Guantanamo Bay? When you were invited by the Department of Defense to go and accepted. I thought it would be good to go and see uh, what they were doing to implement the decisions made in January and February at the White House to uh, have detainees held there by the Department of Defense. Did you have any discussions on those trips about interrogation methods? Uh, I don't know about methods. I, I would say we probably did, only in a sense I can remember, um, and I'm not sure it's this particular trip, but at least on some of the trips, and it may on have been. On any of the trips. Yes. Uh, that they would show us uh, an interrogation room with no one in it, so you could see what the room looked like. And then separately look through, and I, I assume, and I don't know, that the uh, person being interrogated and the interrogator couldn't see us. In other words, like a one-way mirror kind of set where you could see into that. Uh, so having done that, I'm sure they must have discussed... Uh, on, on any of the trips, did you discuss interrogation methods that were directly referenced in the memo that we've been discussing here at this hearing? Uh, I'm not sure, type sure I remember this memo having uh, methods discussed in it. Did you discuss specific types of interrogation methods that interrogators should use while at Guantanamo Bay on the detainees? I don't recall doing that, no. That means you didn't, or you don't recall doing it? It means I don't recall doing it, as I said. It's, it's hard to fathom that you would not have a recollection on specific conversations about types of interrogation methods as opposed to just generally talking about interrogation. Is there a question pending, ma'am? The, the question is, I don't, I don't believe that you don't recall whether you discussed specific interrogation methods. So I'll ask you again. You, did you discuss specific interrogation methods on any of your trips to Guantanamo Bay with inter people who would be administering the interrogation? And as I said to you, I don't recall. Let me be clear to you that there are two different things that may be helpful to you when asking your questions. The Department of Defense I, I interrogation. Really, I, I don't really don't see CIA program. Program. my question. Well, the CIA program, and you'll find uh, when you question me, the participation with respect to the CIA program is more extensive than the DOD program. And I, I, I find I, it so unusual that I don't recall the particular okay. details. Okay, except, except that interrogation, you, you, you're, there is an accusation that interrogation methods went far beyond and up to and past torture following your visits to Guantanamo Bay. So I'm trying to get a sense of whether you actually went there, encouraged those specific interrogation methods, and whether they crossed the line. Yes. So I did not. I'm pretty clear on why I'm asking you the questions and which one I'm asking you. Uh, the on one of the trips that you took, it was weeks after the August 1, 2002 interrogation memo was issued by the Office of Legal, Legal Counsel. Did you have any discussions on, on that trip about that recent Department of Justice legal advice on interrogations? Did you ever discuss the memo which offered legal advice on interrogations with anyone at Guantanamo Bay on any of your trips there? I'm fairly certain, I won't be absolute, but fairly certain that I did not. You, you, that you did not ever discuss did. this August 1st, 2002 legal opinion to the counsel of the president from the Department of Justice. So you deny the suggestion in the Vanity of the Fair report that you encouraged Guantanamo Bay interrogators to do whatever needed to be done? No, I, yes, I do deny that. You do deny that. Yes, that quote is wrong. Okay. Did you observe an interrogation during the trip as has been reported? I you? think we probably did, as I described earlier. And why did you observe an interrogation? The Department of Defense took us around to show us the camp and what was going on, showed us that. Now, I'm, I, I, I emphasize, I'm not sure it's the particular September 2002 trip you're describing, but on at least several of those trips. What did uh, you observe? Uh, observe a detainee in, I believe, an orange jumpsuit sitting in a chair. What uh, kind of interrogation was used? They were talking to him during the brief time that we went Simply there. just conversation? During, no other method? During the brief time that we were there, yes. And, and uh, I don't recall that we could actually hear what was being said. You could look and see mouths moving and infer that there was communication going on. But you saw no physical contact with the interrogator. The only Correct. thing you would have was a very brief look, yes. Okay. I'll get back to balance my time. 